at the end of this video, you should be able to explain the law of conservation of mass, the law of definite proportions, and the law of multiple proportions. Chapter 3, Section 1, The Atom, From Philosophical Idea to Scientific Theory. When you crush a lump of sugar, you can see that it is made up of many smaller particles of sugar. You may grind these particles into a very fine powder, but each tiny piece is still sugar. Now suppose you dissolve the sugar in water. The tiny particles seem to disappear completely. Even if you look at the sugar water solution through a powerful microscope, you cannot see any sugar particles. Yet if you were to taste the solution, you'd know that the sugar is still there. Observations like these led early philosophers to ponder the fundamental nature of matter. Is it continuous and infinitely divisible? Or is it divisible only until a basic indivisible particle that cannot be divided further is reached? The particle theory of matter was supported as early as 400 BC by certain Greek thinkers such as Democritus. He called nature's basic particle an atom, based on the Greek word meaning indivisible. Aristotle was part of the generation that succeeded Democritus. His ideas had a long-lasting impact on Western civilization, and he did not believe in atoms. He thought that all matter was continuous, and his opinion was accepted for nearly 2,000 years. But neither the view of Aristotle nor that of Democritus was supported by any experimental evidence, so each remained speculation until the 18th century. Then scientists began to gather evidence favoring the atomic theory of matter. Foundations of Atomic Theory Virtually all chemists in the late 1700s accepted the modern definition of an element as a substance that cannot be further broken down by ordinary chemical means. It was also clear that elements combine to form compounds that have different physical and chemical properties than those of the elements that form them. There was great controversy, however, as to whether elements always combine in the same ratio when forming a particular compound. The transformation of a substance or substances into one or more new substances is known as a chemical reaction. In the 1790s, the study of matter was revolutionized by a new emphasis on the quantitative analysis of chemical reactions. When liquid bromine is added to aluminum foil, the two substances react. Heat and light are indications of a chemical reaction. Aluminum bromide is produced and deposited onto a cooler surface. Aided by improved balances, investigators began to accurately measure the masses of the elements and compounds they were studying. This led to the discovery of several basic laws. One of these laws was the law of conservation of mass, which states that mass is neither destroyed nor created during ordinary chemical reactions or physical changes. This law of conservation of mass states that the total amount of matter in a closed system remains constant. In other words, matter cannot be created or destroyed during ordinary chemical reactions. In chemical reactions such as the combustion of this match inside a closed container, we find that the mass of the starting materials is the same as the mass of the ending materials. The law of conservation of mass explains why we represent chemical reactions as balanced chemical equations. The number of each atom on each side of the equation is conserved, representing that mass is conserved. The law of conservation of mass works for most things you encounter in daily life. In 1905, however, Albert Einstein showed that matter and energy could be equated with his famous E equals mc squared equation. The implication of this is that the law of conservation of mass will not hold for cases where large amounts of matter were converted to energy, such as in nuclear reactions. The law was revised to become the law of conservation of total mass and energy. The discovery of the law of conservation of mass was soon followed by the assertion that, regardless of where or how a pure chemical compound is prepared, it is composed of a fixed proportion of elements. For example, sodium chloride, also known as ordinary table salt, 
always consists of 39.34% by mass of the element sodium in A and 60.66% by mass of the element chlorine, Cl. The fact that a chemical compound contains the same elements in exactly the same proportions by mass, regardless of the size of the sample or source of the compound, is known as the law of definite proportions. Table salt, sodium chloride, always consists of 39.34% by mass sodium and 60.66% by mass chlorine, no matter how big the sample is or where it comes from. The salt in the walls of a salt mine might consist of 786.8 tons of sodium and 1,213.2 tons of chlorine, but the proportion is still 39.34% by mass sodium and 60.66% by mass chlorine. A salt shaker with 100 grams of salt would contain 39.34 grams of sodium and 60.66 grams of chlorine. The proportions are still the same. A single grain of salt still contains 39.34% by mass sodium and 60.66% by mass chlorine. It was also known that two elements sometimes combine to form more than one compound. For example, the elements carbon and oxygen form two compounds, carbon dioxide and carbon monoxide. Consider samples of each of these compounds, each containing 1.0 grams of carbon. In carbon dioxide, 2.66 grams of oxygen combine with the 1.0 gram of carbon. In carbon monoxide, 1.33 grams of oxygen combine with 1.0 grams of carbon. The ratio of the masses of oxygen in these two compounds is exactly 2.66 to 1.33, or 2 to 1. This illustrates the law of multiple proportions. If two or more different compounds are composed of the same two elements, then the ratio of the masses of the second element combined with a certain mass of the first element is always a ratio of small whole numbers. The law of multiple proportions states that the mass ratio for one of the elements in a compound that combines with the fixed mass of another element can be expressed in small whole numbers. This law can be demonstrated using two compounds formed from hydrogen and oxygen, water and hydrogen peroxide. A 9 gram sample of water results from the reaction of 1 gram of hydrogen gas with 8 grams of oxygen gas. A 17 gram sample of hydrogen peroxide results from the reaction of 1 gram of hydrogen gas with 16 grams of oxygen gas. We note that the amount of hydrogen in both samples is the same. The ratio of the masses of oxygen in these two compounds is 8 to 16 or 1 to 2. From this, we can deduce that there must be twice as much oxygen in hydrogen peroxide as there is in water and the same relative amount of hydrogen in both. It does not tell us, however, exactly how many atoms of each element make up the molecule. We now know, for example, that both water and hydrogen contain two atoms of hydrogen per molecule, a fact we could not deduce from the law of multiple proportions, which simply told us that we had the same relative amount of hydrogen. At this point, you should be able to explain the law of conservation of mass, the law of definite proportions, and the law of multiple proportions.